Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a discussion of the Home Health Emergency Preparedness Requirements. My name is Megan Henry, Marketing Communications Manager for Healthcare First, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items to make sure that your webinar experience is a good one. You've joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. This means if you can hear music through your computer, you will be able to hear our presentation. However, if you'd like to call in using the phone, just locate your audio pane in GoToWebinar and select Use Telephone. The dial-in information and access code will then be displayed. You have the ability to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. The handouts for this webinar can be obtained within GoToWebinar. Just locate your handouts pane in the control panel and select the file for download. You can then click the downloaded file to open or save it. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we will distribute the recording to attendees following the webinar. Before I turn this presentation over to Mary, I would like to tell you just a little bit about who we are and why we do what we do. It all started nearly 25 years ago with a vision to deliver innovative, easy to use, and affordable solutions that enable home health and hospice agencies to put patients before paperwork. And to this day, that vision has never changed. We work hand in hand with more than 4,000 agencies, just like yours, each and every day, to understand your unique needs and deliver the solutions you need to succeed. We aim to ensure that our customers succeed through superior patient care, better efficiency, improved compliance, and optimized revenue cycle management. As you can see on the next slide, we offer a number of affordable solutions designed to help your agency maximize your profit, ensure regulatory compliance, and provide quality patient care. This includes EHR software, revenue cycle management services, CAP surveys, and advanced clinical, financial, and executive analytics. You can pick and choose those solutions that you need now, add more later, or choose to partner with us for our solution suite, which combines all of these products and services into one total agency management package. It's really up to you. And the good news is that Healthcare First is leading the pack and responding to regulatory requirements. We are very nimble and have the resources to quickly adjust and accommodate these regulations to provide the underlying framework that you need. We recently just rolled out our new Care Appliance technology, and I'm really excited to tell you about it. Care Appliance is an innovative clinical workflow that offers guidance to the clinician in the field. It follows the standard steps that a clinician follows when providing patient care. Assess, diagnose, plan, implement, and evaluate. We resolve these compliance requirements and really help you to tell the patient story specifically for each patient. Our system directs the clinician's focus to the patient and not the documentation. It is truly built for providing the best care with the best outcomes and all the while keeping you in compliance. This results in more satisfied patients and caregivers, which will help your reputation and help you grow your agency. If you're interested in learning more about how Healthcare First can help you strengthen profitability, ensure compliance, and improve quality, Please fill out the survey that pops up at the end of the webinar and let us know. Now, what everyone's been waiting for, I would like to introduce to you Mary St. Pierre. Mary is the former Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, where she oversaw the operations of the Regulatory Affairs Department for 20 years. Since retiring in 2013, Mary has served as a consultant providing clinical, operational, and regulatory guidance to the home health industry. Mary? Thanks, Megan, and I, I do apologize. I just realized that emails are popping up on this screen. Um, I don't know whether, should I just leave that and if we can ignore it, did you see it from where you were? Um, Megan, we did. Have... Yeah, we did uh, see it. Um, you might be able, I'm not sure if you're sharing your screen clean, Mary. I did, yes. So why those are popping up, I don't know. I apologize. I think the only other solution maybe is just to exit out of email in its entirety if you've got the ability to do that. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure how to go about doing that at this point. Um, any suggestions? I don't know without seeing your screen. I think we can just go ahead and continue and just, just X those out as they come through. And I do, I do apologize to the audience for uh, having those pop up. Hopefully there won't be any more. Uh, so today we're going to talk about what home health agencies need to do in order to pre be prepared for the uh, new requirements, the emergency preparedness regulations that are going into effect and will be enforced as of November the 16th of this year. Uh, these have been in the process of being developed, written guidance written for them over the past several years. And uh, CMS is, is ready, has rolled them out, and in fact has issued draft uh, surveyor guidance. Uh, I know many of you, um, I'm sure all of you have, have emergency preparedness programs in place. The important thing at this point is to make sure that your programs are in compliance with the regulatory requirements. But what I'm going to talk about today are the federal regulations. So you also have to keep in mind that many of the states, probably the majority of states, have emergency preparedness requirements for their health care providers as well. So um, once you have these federal regulations on PAT, the very next thing you need to do is take a look at what are your state regulations. Are there requirements above and beyond what the federal government wants Medicare certified home health agencies to do? And also, I, I would be negligent if I didn't mention about Harvey and Irma, the hurricanes. I be, I'm sure that some of you are finding yourselves uh, in situations as a result of the, uh, the, the the storms, the flooding, the evacuations, the loss of power, and I and my thoughts and prayers are with you, hoping that you're coping and that your patients are coping. Um, I, there was a disastrous situation this morning on the news. I, I don't know if you had been aware of that, but a um, nursing home in Florida had six deaths today. They uh, apparently lost power didn't have backup power, um, six of the patients died, several others are in critical condition, and according to the latest news report, there's both criminal investigation as well as Medicare fraud investigation of this nursing home. Uh, certainly home health agencies don't have the responsibility that, that inpatient facilities have, the sheltering in place requirements, the facility requirements, um, but there are obligations that home health agencies do have under these conditions of participation and hopefully I can tell you what they are. I, I can't tell you how to go about doing all these things, but I can provide you with resources and um, tools and other organiza organizations that can give you the how-to information that you're going to need. Um, so, um, well, with that, the objectives today are to identify the preparedness regulations for home health agencies and the surveyor guidance that's out there. This is still considered draft surveyor guidance by CMS, but I don't anticipate major changes to come in the final. And then to help you to identify those resources that you can, you can look at, you can refer to, you can coordinate with. Uh, CMS's goals, they want to have an emergency preparedness program, all the Medicare certified providers, and they want you to address the medical and non-medical, those social needs that patients have, and um, to ensure pre predictable staff behavior. So identifying the needs, addressing the needs of your patient, but also educating your staff so that they understand how to respond, what they need to do, responding to emergency situations. Uh, also, they want um, the, the providers to respond in a timely manner. They want you to collaborate with government agencies. They want your response, your planning to be organized, and they want it to be effective. 
and you'll see the, the requirement throughout of analyzing, reanalyzing, um, reassessing, replanning, doing everything on a regular basis, either as needed or at least at least annually. And you'll see that in, in the slides as we as we go through. So as I mentioned, enforcement is November the 16th. And all providers are required to have uh, an all hazardous hazards approach to their emergency preparedness plan, their program. Um, the regulation is quite complex in that it includes all providers, but only some parts of the rule apply to some providers and not to others. The same with the surveyor guidance that some of the requirements apply to hospitals only, end stage renal disease um, uh, organizations, home health agencies, hospices, and so it gets quite cumbersome to try to work your way through those guidances. And I worked with Healthcare First, and we did produce uh, a, a guide for emergency preparedness for home health agencies that is more detailed than these slides, but is built on these slides, which are taken from the surveyor guidelines. And so you'll see the numbers that I've attached to each of the slides actually refer to uh, one of the tags in the surveyor guidance. Now, with home health agencies, you don't have that, um, that requirement to shelter in place. You don't have those facility requirements. Uh, that inpatient inpatient facilities have, um, including hospices, hospices that have uh, inpatient hospice sites. So uh, with home health, we're just focusing on the patient in the home and um, how you as an organization need to train your staff and coordinate with the community. Home health agencies during an emergency may decide to open their facility or close their facility. Uh, it is up to the, each individual home health agency to make that decision and that decision would be part of your plan and whether you uh, close the facility under all circumstances or that you may be um, limit services during certain types of emergencies, and that's where your total all-hazard approach assessment comes in, starting there. Uh, well, another thing to keep in mind is the regulations don't specify the quantity or the level of detail of your program, uh, but you must have a program in place that meets the individual items that are in the regulation. So, there are four elements to this emergency preparedness rule. You have to do a risk assessment and planning. Uh, you also must establish policies and procedures related to all of those, those, that risk assessment and the planning and the operation of the organization. You have to develop a communication plan, not only communication with your own staff and with your patients, but also communication with um, with the community, with the emergency preparedness people in your state or in your county, uh, identifying a communication plan with other providers, uh, how you might communicate with a hospital or with a nursing home on behalf of your patients. If in fact you decide that you are going to help them in, in evacuation situations. And then the fourth component is the training and testing of the home health agency personnel. So the first E tag that applies to home health agencies, uh, and, and the regulation at this point is labeled 42 CFR 484.22. But some of you may have noticed that in the home health agency conditions of participation, that were finalized and will be going into effect. They have identified the emergency preparedness as 484.102. And my understanding is they are one and the same, but my understanding is that they will be changing the number, the regulation number to the 102, um, probably by January when com uh, re compliance with the COP is required. Could COPs are required, or excuse me, the remainder of the COPs, other than and aside from the emergency preparedness one. So the very first thing you must do is establish an emergency preparedness program, and it must meet the following requirements. It has to be 
in, in compliance with all the federal, state, and local requirements. Uh, and that are not, that's not only emergency requirements, that's the other regulations, for example, HIPAA um, and, and those, those types, types of things. Uh, also, when, uh, and if you have a survey, your administration's, your administrative staff has to be able to show the surveyor that, in fact, you have an emergency preparedness program and you can present them with written evidence of that program. Uh, the program has to have a comprehensive approach to health, safety, security needs, staff, and the patient needs. And so, uh, you have to make sure that you identify all of those needs. That's going to be part of your assessment. You also have to show that you have a way to coordinate with those other healthcare facilities and coordinate with the community. And then uh, it has to include all the required elements, and we will go through those elements uh, in, in this presentation. And then, of course, it has to be updated annually. And again, you'll see that I will mention each with each aspect of your emergency preparedness program uh, that they have to be updated annually. So uh, number one in your emergency preparedness program is you have to have a plan. And uh, it, you, you must, if a surveyor comes to the door, be able to pr produce a copy of that plan. And not only must you have a copy of the plan that you have for today, but you also need to be able to demonstrate in the future that you update that plan annually, that it's reviewed and that it's updated on at least an annual basis. And uh, in addition to that, I mentioned risk assessment. You not only have to do the risk assessment, you have to be able to show the surveyor, give them evidence of how you conducted that risk assessment. And then you also have to be able to show the evidence of how you collaborated with the local emergency preparedness officials. Um, if you have uh, in your plan that you are going to have a disruption in your service, what the duration or inter uh, of the interruptions would be, and or, uh, to the best of your ability, and then what arrangements you have in place to, to resolve or ameliorate the, any interruptions that there are. So again, these are components of the emergency preparedness plan that have to be part of the emergency preparedness program. So risk assessment, the emergency preparedness plan has to be based on a risk assessment. Now, one of the uh, one of the documents that, along with this handout, is available to you is National Association for Home Care and Hospice. They prepared a booklet. It was back when I was there. Um, it was developed in 2003. I know they are in the process of updating that uh, that booklet, but the information in it, it is valuable information that can help you. And when you uh, look at the uh, risk assessment you must carry out, that document does give you lots of details on what things to consider. That natural disasters, man-made disasters, your own facility, what, what potential problems within your home health agency, um, problems that are community-based, and then uh, in addition to that, problems in the patient's home, that what patients need to be educated on or be assessed for in their own homes. Um, things that you can consider in that assessment, equipment failure, utility failure, uh, interruptions in communication, uh, travel, gas, supplies, other supplies that you might need, um, IT system failures, the, the, those, those are some of the considerations. Um, other things, not just, um, not just man-made, but are, are there are the potential where we went through the whole uh, scare about Ebola considerations for that and uh, disease outbreak, as I mentioned. 
So transportation failures, um, bridges out, those kinds of things all have to be considered in relationship to where you are and in, 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 in your community. So one of the things on the list is wildfires. Well, if you're if you're if you're in an area where that is a potential problem, then that must be addressed as part of your emergency preparedness plan. So here's a listing of some of the things that are potential hazards. Uh, the NAC document provides you with additional hazards and um, also gives guidance on how you would uh, evaluate those hazards for their probability, their vulnerability, and, um, and, and, and gives you a checklist that you can use for documenting that you did the risk assessment and how you then uh, evaluate it and determine the rating for the different hazards that would be in your community and potentially in your area. So the emergency plan, as I said, has to be based on a risk assessment and um, the specific actions to be taken. So what are the hazards for your agency based on your location, based on your service area? And, and do you have different offices? Do you have multiple offices? And are the hazards different from one office to the other? So therefore, if that's the case, your plan would have to differ from one, your assessment would have to differ, and then your plan would have to differ from one office to the other. Um, you have to identify it, things like communication, evacuation, fuel needs and how you might handle those fuel needs, and your uh, agency's financial issues, financial security, and the, uh, who are the other providers in your community that you will work with and collaborate with. Um, you can, agencies are, home health agencies do have the option of meeting staff needs and providing transportation, sheltering, both the staff, the, their staff as well as family members, but it is not a requirement, it's something optional. So the plan on um, TAG E6 requires you to have the strategies for the events identified in the, in the risk assessment. And they have to be based on who is your patient population? What types of patients do you have? Do you have special needs patients? Do you have infusion patients? Uh, it, it has to be very specifically directed toward your patients that you serve in that agency and the types of services that you provide. And then you have to determine whether in that risk assessment, you will be able to continue to provide services or not. As I said, you can remain open, you can close, it's, but it's part of your risk assessment and your emergency plan to make that determination. In addition, you have to have an individual plan for each patient as part of the comprehensive assessment. So what are the potentials for the dangers to that patient in their home? Uh, and um, how and when uh, would the patient contact the local emergency official so uh, that you not only are identifying the patient need, but you're providing them with guidance and, and as to who to contact and when to contact them should there be an emergency. And then you have to have that plan that's integrated with the state and local entities. So it's going to require assessing your needs, but reaching out to your community. And most communities now do have emergency preparedness task force. Um, state home health state associations have done tremendous work within their state on helping home health agencies to communicate, collaborate with other other. Uh, entities within the state, uh, both as better resources, but also uh, to provide some help and service. So ETAG 0007, the plan includes identifying your patient population, as I mentioned, the, their needs if services are interrupted, and then if you're going to provide service, how are you going to go about meeting those needs of vulnerable patients? And, and it may be that vulnerable, pa vulnerable patients are identified and then their information provided to those 
resources within the state or within the community um, that, that might be activated or contacted in the event of an emergency or a crisis, but that you do have to decide what your strategies would be within your agency. And then you have to look at continuity of op operations. Um, if, if and when you decide to uh, continue operations, what are your procedures? What kinds of services will you provide? Will you accept new patients? Um, is your, do you have um, a delineation or a determination of what your surge capacity is and whether you're beyond that, whether you might need to call on other organizations to, to, to take your patients on if there are other parts of the community that might be able to do that or other home health agencies, or whether you might be able to help as an agency. I'll never forget during Katrina, the, the agency I spoke with in Mississippi, who um, they were able to actually help the hospital with their surge capacity. Uh, they had infusion patients. The hospital needed to evacuate. The patients were in an area that they could go home. So this home health agency was actually helping the hospital with their, that had exceeded their surge capacity. But you have to determine who's going to be in charge during, uh, during an emergency. That uh, authority, who's determined to be the lead person, but also if that person isn't available, who will take over for them, what that succession plan is. And then again, if you're providing services, what staff would be available, what their specific roles would be, what they would be responsible for should they be activated during a crisis. Um, you have to have follow-up uh, with your on-duty staff, your patients, and you have to uh, determine what are the critical resources you'll need. Obviously, in home health, it's gasoline. Um, and communication needs, there are two of the biggest, biggest problems and issue areas. Um, other critical resources would be patient supplies, care supplies, dressing supplies. Uh, then what are you going to do with, um, in, in regard to vital records and IT data protection? So this is your plan that is patient population and services specific in, in ETAG 007. And um, in addition to the, the record protection, your staffing, your operations planning, you have to determine financial resources and are you prepared um, to, to continue to operate financially in the event of a crisis. And then uh, finally, are there other facilities that you might be referring patients to? Uh, in order for them to get the care that they need, whether it be other home health agencies or nursing home or hospital, or the shelters. And patients, uh, there are uh, the, the special needs patients were cared for in shelters during these last two hurricanes, and there were calls out for volunteer nurses. And that would be part of your planning with the community. If you don't plan to operate your home health agency, have you worked with the community that your nurses may wish to volunteer to provide services in other sites or in these shelters? So continuing with the patient population and services on the E007 tag, you have to determine who's at risk. Which of your patients would be at risk during an emergency? Um, are they independent? Do they have cognitive problems? Are they, do they have mobility problems? Are they able to communicate? And CMS includes uh, the, the cultural and linguistic barriers uh, to, to, to care. Will there be, they want you to consider cultural and linguistic barriers in your emergency plan. Um, transportation, transportation needs, and then the supervision and medical care of those patients. What are their needs? Uh, who in your population must have services? Do, are you serving diabetics that, that receive daily insulin and, and, um, and identifying them as truly patients that need services and referral and, and possibly emergency evacuation. 
also patients with chronic medical disorders and then the pharmacological dependency. I know when all of this was going on with the hurricane, my husband's an insulin-dependent diabetic, and I stopped to think, good grief, do I, would I have thought ahead that I could get, make sure I had on hand, and would the, would the insurance pay for, and would the pharmacy provide me with um, a, a adequate medication, adequate the medical supplies that might last, I think, in the case of these individuals where they had the forewarning of the hurricanes and then are still uh, outside of their homes and, and in shelters a week, week and a half later, would they have, are your patients going to be able to get the uh, drugs that they need, the medications they need to take them through that long span? So uh, the plan, patient population and services plan, also should identify if you're going to use volunteers. And uh, certainly volunteers are a really important consideration uh, for transportation in home health. If uh, your staff don't have vehicles and can't fit to the patient's neighborhood, do you have volunteers? We often, the agency where I worked, we used volunteers during snow emergencies uh, that had uh, volunteers who had vehicles that had four-wheel drive to get to patients' homes when we had heavy snows. And have you ever used volunteers? Have you considered using them? And this is just one example of how you might be able to use volunteers. Uh, what other staffing strategies and, and the surveyor guidance says you must address what other staffing strategies you might use. And then integrating with the state and federally designated healthcare professionals, you're going to have to look in your community, what is, uh, who are these people and how can you work with them, how can they help you. And then uh, the resources from various agencies like FEMA. But as for Tracy, um, which is here and is also, there's a link in the, in, at the end of this uh, presentation, uh, provides tremendous amount of useful information. Now, some of it, like this, the NAC, a resource tool that I, I, I've included a link to and I've mentioned, uh, are older. But they, 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 for the most part, they continue to be extremely helpful as you start to take the steps to implement your program and your plans to make sure you're compliant. Uh, federal organizations, uh, CDC has a huge amount of information. The Joint Commission has a huge amount of information. So. Looking at the resources, the various resources, not only in your community, but also those national, uh, either government or uh, proprietary organizations. So next we need to talk about collaboration. And I've mentioned it repeatedly. You are required to um, look at, in, in terms of your assessment who's out there in the community for you to work with. But in as far as the regulation go, your plan has to demonstrate that you have collaborated with those existing resources out with, with, that are available to you. Uh, you also have to show that you made an effort to contact those officials and what the outcome of that contact was. It may be that you're in a community that there is little or nothing available to help you, um, but you at least have to demonstrate that you made the effort to make the contact. For those patients in need, those vulnerable patients, you need to establish the procedures um, that are required in your community so that you can uh, collaborate with the officials. Uh, I know that um, at many home health agencies told me uh, probably in the when this proposed rule came out several years ago, well, they tried to contact their local rescue squad or the, and that they didn't know what to do and they didn't want their list of patients who needed it, would need evacuation. But years have gone by and certainly with these new, new disasters that we've had, more and more members of the community, other parts of the community, the police, the fire, the rescue are attuned to and are going to be helpful and work with home health agencies. So you need to be able to identify and inform any fish officials of um, 
uh, of any on duty about any patients or staff that you are unable to contact that you have concerns about. And you need to first identify who those who those individuals are. Next come policies and procedures. So your plan has to include risk written emergency preparedness policies and procedures. And you have to be able to show those to the surveyors should they come in. Um, these all just like your plan have to be based on the risk assessment, your policies and procedures would be based on the risk assessment. And they have to detail what your communication plan is. The policies and procedures also have to uh, lay out the training and testing, and we'll go into the details of what's required in that area shortly. And you, policies and procedures reviewed and updated annually, just like your risk assessment, just like like all of the other components. For individual patients, you must show as part of your comprehensive assessment and the way they put it in the survey or guidance that you had discussions to develop the individual patient plan and um, that you've identified the potential disasters for the patient and then you've developed the plan with the patient that you have um, educated the patient on safety steps and that uh, there are answers and solutions resulting from, from discussions. Now, they don't say you have to have this long, detailed, elaborate plan. It can be as simple as a, as a, as a, as a three by five card with identification of their potential their, their potential hazards for them and what you um, and then what you need to do what they need to do and how to contact emergency officials uh, what to do about their medications what to do about any additional needs also that they expect the documentation to show that you've done the education uh, on safety steps for the for the patients as well as their representative and their caregiver and um, that that individualized emergency plan has to be uh, not only in the patient's file, but a copy has to be provided to the patient and caregiver. Next, uh, informing officials. You need to work, as I've said repeatedly, to work with your state and local preparedness officials. You need to identify and inform them the people who need evacuation. When you are determining uh, what information to give to these officials, you've identified patients that are vulnerable, you identify patients that you feel would need help with evacuation, you do have to consider whether they approve of you providing that information. Uh, the information provided has to be HIPAA compliant, and they do want the clinical information um, that they want it to include if patients agreeable to sharing that information, um, a level of mobility, medications, any equipment, um, does the patient have respiratory equipment, does the patient have dressing needs, do they have other special needs, including the communication, um, cognitive or intellectual disabilities. They even mentioned special dietary needs. I don't know how detailed you can get on that, but certainly if it were something like tube feedings, they would, you would certainly want to include that. And everything you do not only has to be in compliance with the federal laws, but also must be in compliance with state and local laws and community practice. Uh, the staff and patients under your policies and procedures, you have to have triage procedures um, for identification of a need to interrupt service uh, and, and how you are going to go about notifying employees, contractors, patients about any interruption in service. Also, procedures, um, patient procedures to determine needed services for those on-duty staff who are going to take care of those patients. And then, again, notifying the officials of on-duty staff and patients you're unable to contact. And I mentioned that previously, but that is, appears in two different places. Uh, surveyors are going to look to be sure that you have evidence that this plan is followed should you have had an emergency situation where you needed to activate it. Now, E0023, we go into medical record documentation, and you have to have a, a system of records 
that preserves patient information. So do you have off-site uh, storage? Do you have uh, uh, do you have electronic health record? Do you have backup systems? Um, they, all of these things make sure that the information needed to provide services to the patients is preserved, but uh, also the patient confidentiality is protected. Uh, securing and maintaining availability of records. Again, I can say to you, this is what you have to do. You need to reach out to those others in your community, reach out to um, your software vendor, reach out to those experts in these areas to find out just how do I go about doing this. Um, even the document provided by NAC kind of gives you what this is what you have to do, but very little on how to go about it. And they're going to look on, on survey, is there compliance with those medical records policies? Can you demonstrate that you created those policies and procedures and you complied. You also have to have the policies and procedures uh, regarding volunteers if you decide to use them. And if you decide to use volunteers, um, you have to do so in accordance with the community regulations. And you also have to consider what the HIPAA requirements and, use, and, and, and how what you can divulge regarding the patient's medical condition in, in use of volunteers. Now, there are special HIPAA uh, allowances during an emergency. So um, what, what applies during normal situations um, it, it does not necessarily apply during disasters. There are, there are, there are leeways to the HIPAA rules. And again, integrating state and federal uh, designated healthcare professionals is applicable. So there may be resources available in terms of healthcare professionals who can pro provide service and help to your agency. Uh, the, the, um, and based on how you work with those other providers in the community. And so it's important to indicate how you would use those healthcare professionals who are volunteers, just like they had the healthcare professionals helping in the shelters, the volunteer healthcare professionals. Might you consider having volunteers, nurses working with your agency during a disaster? Next comes the communication plan. It has to comply with those uh, federal, state, and local laws. And again, that communication plan has to be updated annually. It has to be in writing. And basically, although I did spell it out on several of the slides that the things that you do have to be in writing, basically pretty much everything has to be in writing. You have to be able to produce the evidence that you have complied, that you've done these things. Uh, the content of the communication plan, and then how you document these, how you preserve this information, how you update this information are really important considerations. So in your communication plan, they want you to have your contact information about your staff and contractors, also the patient's position, any other, other facilities and volunteers that you are collaborating with as part of, your, as part of your emergency program, your emergency plan. Um, the contact information has to be available. You have to be able to access it. Uh, again, updated throughout the year, uh, not just annually, but as that information changes, <laughs> it is to be updated so that what you access should an emergency arise is what's true and usable today. Uh, it has to uh, and include the information contact information for any facilities that you identified as resources that you are going to use. And if you're using electronic data storage for this information, it has to be back up with hard copies, and you have to be able to reproduce these lists, access them, these lists during an emergency. So you will need to show if a surveyor comes in and, and, is, and is evaluating you to applying the regulations related to emergency preparedness, how can you demonstrate uh, and show that you have met this requirement? It also has to include the federal, state, tribal, regional, local emergency preparedness stack if available and how it applies to you and your community. You, you may not have 
all of these, you may only have one of these, but you have to, or you may have none of them, and you have to show how you reached out and uh, try to, to utilize their resources. And, and if you are have identified them as a resource, then the contact information has to be included in your communication plan. And then they go on to, and then the other sources of assistance. The, um, it has to be updated annually as far as these outside organizations, and it has to be readily available. And again, the same thing applies as far as electronic data storage, um, data backup with hard copies, and the ability to reproduce this list or access it during an emergency. Uh, the communication plan has to address very specific items. It has to provide what is your primary and alternate means of communicating with all of these government and community agencies. What's your um, means of communication in terms of um, alternate methods of communication should your primary use of communication cell phones, for example, be out. Have you evaluated and what is the result of evaluating these uh, other means of communication, the weather radio, the ham radios, the satellite telephones, and uh, which of these, if any of these are accessible to you, what they are, have them listed in your communication plan, and then review and update annually. Uh, the patient data in there, you have to have policies and procedures that, that the uh, general information condition location of your patients is available and, and then how you're going to go about sharing any information with other health care providers that might be taking over to care for that patient in lieu of you not being able to provide the services. Uh, and evidence that that system for communicating if you, it has to be timely, it has to be accurate, and, um, and, and they talk about the information being available to family members. Now, I don't know the detail of that. Unfortunately, I can't help you with that, but um, that is one of the requirements, and I think as we get along further into this, we'll, we'll learn more from CMS what they expect. HIPAA compliance, as I mentioned, and again, patients' rights patient's ability, give them the opportunity to uh, agree or disagree with the disclosure of information. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, communication plan, your needs as an agency, you need to identify what your needs would be during an emergency, and then how do you communicate those needs to uh, those authorities, the government authorities, the, the uh, community, local authorities, that they might be able to help you and provide provide resources. Uh, what is your agency capacity? Can you take patients? Do you need help with patients? How many patients are receiving services at a time? And have you identified through triaging the patient's acuity level? Who do you have that has high tech needs? How often are visits needed for patients? Uh, you also need to identify in that communication plan if you can help, how much help you can provide, and in what way. It might be a matter of uh, just uh, uh, providing volunteer staff who would help at another site should your agency not be providing services directly. And then things like what are road conditions, what do you need in the way of fuel, how you can be considered to be uh, a, a, maybe not a first responder, but certainly uh, an essential personnel in your community so that you would have access to fuel should it be limited in order to get to to get to um, the to, to patients' homes. And then uh, what kind of assistance might your organization need in in terms of patient evacuations and transfers? Now training and testing, I mentioned that you have to have a written training and testing program, and it has to be based on your plan, your assessment, and your program within your agency. Uh, you have to include and spell out what the content is, and it has to reflect, as I said, those risks identified in the assessment. What will your do? How will you communicate if you have a closure? 
how will staff know what the status is of the agency operation? The um, training and testing has to be provided to your, all staff, all contractors, as well as any volunteers that you've identified. And then you have to have the testing to evaluate how effective was your training program. Did the staff, do the staff understand what the program is, the policies and procedures and the protocols? And um, there is a requirement for drills and exercises to be conducted. Your testing has to identify any problems or gaps. Where do you need improvement in terms of your emergency program so that you're testing the program as well as testing the personnel. Uh, it also will be testing those tracking systems that you have for your patients. Uh, and then, as I mentioned a while back, anything that you do has to be um, specific if you are a multiple location agency, um, specific to the area, the place, the geographics that where that other uh, different parts of your agency are located. And then, of course, evidence that you reviewed and updated this training and testing program annually. The training program, it includes the initial um, role consistent training. So everybody, as of November 16th, has to be, if the expectation is as of November 16th, you will have in place your program, your policies and procedures, your communication plan, and your training program, training and testing. And uh, the, so all of your staff will have to have been tested in the policies and procedures, trained and tested, excuse me, trained in the policies and procedures. And then as from that point on, any new staff would have to be trained and tested. And again, that would have to happen at least annually. You have to have files to verify they have the training, the content of the training, the methods used to train, and um, that you would modify that training program each year as necessary, as appropriate. Now, the testing consists of um, uh, several elements. You have to conduct exercises to test your plan at least annually. And so what you have to do is have a full scale exercise that is community based. Or if that's not possible, a community based exercise isn't possible, isn't acceptable, then you have to do an individual agency based exercise. And that exercise has to show how risks were identified in the risk assessment, how um, unannounced staff drills include unannounced staff drills using emergency procedures. And then um, if, in fact, you happen to have your Houston, Texas agency or a Florida agency and you, um, you um, had an actual emergency need to activate your plan, you wouldn't have to do this part one, the full scale exercise for a year. You would be exempt for a year if you had to activate your plan. Part two that you must do is conduct additional exercises that could be a second full scale exercise, just to spell that number one, or you could do a tabletop exercise that has group discussions, a facilitator, uh, scenarios, discussion of problems, and um, designed it to sort of to challenge an emergency plan. And you want to, through this, analyze your response, maintain documentation of all of these things that you did. The testing, you have to document all of these things that you did. You have to analyze um, responses to the drills and the emergency events the uh, analysis and document your analysis and response and the result and emergency program update. And, they, and you have to maintain records of this for no less than three years. Uh, if you're part of a health system, you have to show that you don't have your own individual agency plan, but rather you were included in the uh, health system program, you are actively involved, you've documented your involvement annually, and you participate in the program updates, and you have a copy of the entire integrated unified emergency program available. And that the surveyor show up, 
agency administrator leadership has to be able to describe how that system works. So uh, the next three slides are resources. There's the regulation. There's the draft surveyor guidance. There's a link to an online training emergency preparedness. It's actually a surveyor training, but there is a link for providers. Um, there's a CMS checklist. Now, I have to advise you that that CMS checklist is for all providers. So you have to remember that you don't have the shelter in place and you don't have the evacuation requirements that those inpatient facilities have. I mentioned Asper Tracy and the NAC Toolkit. I mentioned Joint Commission has programs and also CDC and Red Cross have valuable information on um, that you can include in your or guidance and education to patients about what they need for an emergency preparedness kit, those types of things. So with that, if there are any questions, I think we have a few minutes. And Deanne is going to, um, Deanne is going to uh, read the questions for me. Sure. Thank you, Mary. Let's pull up and see what we have here. Okay. The first question we have is, my agency has a very robust emergency preparedness program through our public health programs and work with the state on emergency preparedness. Will it be acceptable to use or refer to this work that has already been done? You certainly, it would, it would be a valuable tool to use that, at, but you have to demonstrate how you have incorporated that in and it is now part of your home health agency's policies, procedures, protocols. In other words, you as a home health agency have to meet the requirements individually. Uh, you can't just use the health department's plan and say, uh, that, and, and say that's what you're doing you have to show how you've incorporated it within your home health agency. Now that's different, I'm assuming, than that integrated health system. And um, let me go back, and I'm not sure I defined that. Um, CMS does define an integrated health system. So if you can show that that is an integrated health system, you are part of that as an integrated health system, then that would be sufficient as long as you meet all the criteria in E0042. Okay. Our next question is, does the testing need to occur before November 16th, i.e. full-scale drill? My assumption and um, and this is based on anything I've read to date, unless CMS backs off and provides further clarification, that enforcement is effective November the 16th, which means that you need to be in compliance effective November 16th with the regulation. Okay, our next question is, we are a hospital-based home health agency. We have integrated our emergency plan with the hospital. Is that a problem? That's not a problem as long as you can show on this slide uh, where I put the uh, guidance for EE42 that you, in fact, your agency, your agency leadership has had documented evidence that they took these steps, that they were part of the development, part of the program, um, how they were involved, can produce a copy of it and how, as part of it, how it works, how it would work. Okay, sure. Our next question is actually one that I can answer. It's, uh, will Healthcare First be placing anything in the assessments about the emergency plan? Uh, we are going to be updating the comprehensive documentation, so both the evaluations and the OASIS documents, with additional information tied to emergency preparedness and that will be coming out in an upcoming release. Um, so if you keep an eye out on uh, release notes, uh, we'll have additional information. Um, like I said, it'll be coming up in a, a release very soon. Okay, the next question, if there has not been any emergency on our community, do we need to do a mock emergency for training? Well, this, this 
steps um, as far as the testing go, and let me go back to that, that you have to show that you, um, well, let's go through the um, this slide, the E0039. Full-scale exercise, it's community-based, but if there isn't anything available, then you have to do your own exercise. That you And through that exercise, show what risks were identified and that, um, and that there are staff drills, unannounced staff drills. So um, I guess the answer to that is you do have to do these things. And then the second, the full-scale exercise or tabletop exercise. Okay. All right, the next question is, our agency is in South Carolina, uh, just activated our system for IRMA. Sounds like this will count as our yearly full-scale exercise for one year. What type of document documentation will the surveyors look for to prove that we did this? Okay, and they're, they're going to look to see um, that, that you have recorded, spelled out exactly what you did for activating your emergency plan. So. Whatever way you can put into writing what steps you took and how you followed the plan or an overall of the fact that you implemented it, activated it, and then any issues that you identified through that, that, that should be sufficient. Okay. The next question is, we are a very small home health agency and we have contact red we contact red cross local hospitals skilled nursing facilities how do we document that we could not join that uh, that they wouldn't participate they wouldn't allow you to participate in there the best thing you can do is 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 record those steps either whether they were phone calls or attempt to visit in person or anything that you did to try to reach out and then the, what the result of what that was Okay. Uh, their the failure question. to follow their identification of why you why they couldn't work with you. Okay, sure. Uh, the next question is one that I can answer. It's another question uh, regarding healthcare first, um, and I'll actually uh, reach out to this individual and just make sure I'm answering their uh, question. Um, but it looks like they're asking for ways to identify the emergency preparedness information. We do have uh, reports in the program already uh, uh, that you can see the um, emergency preparedness status and codes that you add to the patient. But again, I'll reach out to you individually and make sure that um, there wasn't additional questions that you had on that. All right, the next question is what percentage of your staff has to participate in the full scale and or tabletop exercises? The way the regulation reads, it's all of your staff and contractors. Okay. What types of events are acceptable as unannounced drills and how many per year? Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that's a tough one. <laughs> I can't help you with it, but uh, but um, that I and I don't think that the interpretive guidance was very detailed on that. Um, yeah, that's something that uh, I don't know, Deanna. I might be able to get that information back to you. Okay. Um, next question is: Where can we find the surveyor guide for emergency preparedness? Okay, and I put a link. Um, it, in those resources, and let me find that for you, it's um, the second emergency preparedness survey or guidance. Okay. Then, okay, perfect. All right, the next question is, what if you are a small community what, uh, and you were told that they will not do a live test? Um, looks like she had contacted the closest city and they had already done a live full-scale test. Um, can you file an extension? If not, um, what do does she do to keep them from getting a deficiency? Okay, so then you have to go back to those things within your agency that you can do. The um, uh, if you can't participate in in a community test, let's go back to that slide. That um, that it, if it's not accessible, then you have to 
uh, do an exercise to show that you identified your risk and an exercise uh, that includes those unannounced staff drills is in those procedures. Okay. All right, the next one I think is tied to an agency that may be utilizing first home care, but if I don't get uh, this correct, please uh, send some additional information. The question is, where will there be added buttons we will need to include in our clinical charting within our system? If you're using the first home care system, we are going to be adding some additional fields and ways to click an action button that'll take you into the chart and be able to pull in certain emergency preparedness information and there will be additional new fields added that you can fill out when you're in the comprehensive document um, to indicate the emergency preparedness. Um, so um, if that doesn't answer your question or if you're using another software, I wouldn't necessarily be able to speak to whether or not the other software would be adding additional uh, ways for you to chart the emergency preparedness information. Uh, let's see here. Looks like the, the, this looks like the last quest, question as of right now. It says, good afternoon and thank you for the webinar. My question is not related to the current topic, but related to follow-up from previous webinar where you mentioned that you will be able to provide some details about the language translation services, which you, um, any suggestions on where we could look for the, those translation service company? Yeah, I, um, Deanna, can I get that to you? And then- Sure, absolutely. That, that person. Yeah, and I'll get, uh, I, I know there is, there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> and some are better than others, but I can, I'll get that back to you, uh, Deanna, and then you can send that to that person. Okay, the next slide, uh, we do have a few more questions that came up. Would participating in the Great California Shakeout be an appropriate community-based exercise? I don't, I'm not familiar with the Great California Shakeout. Are, are you, Mary? Right now, no. Uh -uh. Looks like um, the surveyor guidance link that we have doesn't work. So what we'll do when we send out the recording to everyone that participated, um, we'll verify the, the link that we have, the URL link that we have um, to make sure that uh, everyone has the right one. And that looks like and the last. And I should mention that um, I did try, let me go see, and see which one of those. I did try one of those links earlier, and it didn't click on here. However, when I cut it and pasted it into the, into the URL, it, it went directly to the resource. So I don't know why the links appear alive, but apparently they're, oh, no, that shows. I think that shows. Yeah, but I did have that problem with one of them. So. Uh, <laughs> So you can cut and paste, I know that works. Okay, well then um, at this point, I'd like to hand it back over to Megan. All right, well thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Mary. As we wrap up, I just wanna reiterate that we at Healthcare First understand that your number one priority is your patients. Scheduling, reporting, compliance, all are critical to managing your business, but fulfilling these operational and administrative obligations can come between you and your patients. Our mission is to enable your agency to focus on patient care where you are needed most. Mary, if you could fast forward close to the end, I think it's the I second to last guys. slide. No, no problem. And that's uh, it. That's it. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, as you can see here, we have set a number of initiatives in 2017 to proactively address the growing needs of our customers, and we look forward to working hand-in-hand -hand with our customers to give them the solutions they need for success this year and beyond. We hope that you will take a look at our products and services and schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a member of our team to learn why more agencies choose us and discover the Healthcare First difference. That concludes today's presentation. As a reminder, the webinar recording as well as the handouts for this webinar will be made available uh, on our website in the next week or so and via email. Lastly, as you log out of this webinar, you will see a survey pop up asking for feedback on today's presentation. 
Please fill out this survey as your feedback is important to us when planning future online events. On behalf of Mary St. Pierre and the entire team here at Healthcare First, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again for more webinars in the future. Have a great afternoon.